Welcome into the Ether, a podcast focusing on all things Ethereum, the leading blockchain for decentralized applications. I'm Eric Connor, your host and founder of ETHUB, a decentralized information hub for Ethereum. Into the Ether features deep dives on topics with prominent guests in the community, as well as ETHUB weekly recaps featuring Anthony Sassano. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ETHUB weekly recap. On these episodes, we discuss the ETHUB weekly newsletter, which covers the latest news from the Ethereum ecosystem and crypto space as a whole. This week, we'll be discussing the news from March 4th to March 10th. Hey, Anthony, want to walk us through the news? Hey, Eric. Sure. So uh, a couple of notes uh, about, you know, ETHUB in general. Uh, so this week, it was the year, like it was it was our birthday. It was a year since I started the newsletter. Uh, previously, the newsletter was block by block. And then, of course, it got merged into ETHUB when um, we launched ETHUB. Uh, a few people, I think, were confused. It's not ESUB's first birthday. It's just the newsletter's first birthday. ETHUB was only launched on January 3rd of this year. So we've still got a, you know, a couple of nine months or something to go until ETHUB turns one. Uh, but thank you, everyone, for your well wishes. Uh, looking forward to another year of awesome newsletters. Uh, we also put out the bounties this week. So there's a couple of bounties up at the moment for ETH1.x and ETH2.0. So improving those sections on the uh, documentation uh, section of the ETHUB website. Uh, we've done that through Gitcoin. It was actually pretty cool. I posted them last night myself. I just went through Gitcoin's interface, uh, put all the details in, and it was really straightforward, actually. You link the GitHub issue in there uh, via the URL. It was super simple. So I definitely recommend Gitcoin to anyone else seeking bounties from uh, for content they need or for bug fixes or anything like that, uh, especially uh, developers. So yeah, it's a super easy platform to use. But if you're interested in getting involved and earning money uh, for contributing to ETHUB, definitely go check that out. It's in the, the links to them are in the newsletter or our Medium page. So I'll move on to the news now. So one bit of news that I wanted to talk about this week was Fidelity. So Fidelity have put uh, their custody and trading platform live. Unfortunately, it's only for Bitcoin at the moment. It's not for Ether. Uh, they did say in the press release that Ether will come soon, but it's more complex because of uh, you know different forks and, ne- and network upgrades that happen in Ethereum. I thought this was a bit of a cop out because it's not hard to manage these sorts of things. Exchanges have been doing it for a long time. Uh, Block Explorers, every other infrastructure provider has been doing it for such a long time that to use that as an excuse for not having Ether on there is quite poor. And I think from a competitive standpoint, it's quite bad as well because it just opens up the you know, the doors to other people eating Fidelity's lunch here. So what did you think of this one, Eric? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a weird excuse, right? I mean, if you think about it too, over the last four years, Bitcoin's actually had more forks that have um, kind of left a coin behind than Ethereum has, right? Ethereum had Ether Classic, but we've recently gone through you know, Bitcoin Cash and all the the recent fork drama in the last year. And those actually turn into real assets as well. So it's kind of strange for them to say that about Ethereum. And, you know, this isn't going to go away. We're going to be going through regular network upgrades for years, right? And that's just kind of what the Ethereum community has decided on. So um, hopefully they kind of figure this out. I mean, it definitely is cool to see a large company like Fidelity start to offer custody. You know, I think a lot of people are still scared, maybe rightfully so, because I know managing crypto funds is intimidating to a lot of people and, you know, having the thought that if you just lose this private key, all your funds are gone. So, you know, the reality is a lot of people that are, you know, interested in finance and are used to you know, typical financial system and buying and trading stocks and stuff like that, they're actually going to want to probably trust their crypto investment with someone like Fidelity or a bank. I know a lot of people um, like us or probably a lot of people listening to this don't want to do that, but the reality is a lot of people out there will want to. So I think this could open a new gate for, for crypto in general. You know, at least they're starting with Bitcoin and I'm sure they'll get around to Ethereum at some point. Yeah, it definitely is a net positive for the space, uh, not a negative in, in general. Of course, they're going to start with Bitcoin. They did mention they're going to just go down the list in, in market cap, basically, and list it. So it would be Ether, and then I think XRP is third, and then fourth, I think it's Litecoin. But, you know, you get the gist of it down the list. Uh, I'm not sure how many assets they'll support eventually, uh, but they'll definitely be supporting Ether sometime into the future. So uh, keen to keep an eye on that and keen to see that launched. So we spoke a bit last week about uh, Maker and how Maker DAO, they were raising this the DAI stability fee from 0.5% to 3.5% in order to stabilize DAI. Uh, so that happened a couple of days ago. And since then, uh, Mike McDonald, uh, the creator of Maker.tools, the, the website, he put together a stability fee page. So it shows a 
chart of the stability fee over time. So uh, the different changes over time in the stability fee and the mints and burns of die that correlate to that. It was really awesome to see that when the stability fee uh, dropped from 2.5% to 0.5%, the mints in die just skyrocketed, obviously, because people got you know, access to really, really cheap credit uh, and minted a lot of die to do that, to, to go extra long on ETH. Now, what we've seen recently is the stability fee was raised from 1.5% to 3.5%, and we haven't actually seen much of an uptick in the burning of DAI. So that was the whole point of the stability fee, to get people to pay back, their, pay down their CDPs, m uh, burn some DAI, because uh, DAI was losing its peg due to too much supply and not enough demand. Uh, so basically, that doesn't seem to be doing the job so far. I'm assuming that the maker team in the next couple of days will put forward another proposal and uh, to raise the stability fee even further to get people to pay down their CDPs. So it's, it's very interesting watching this kind of happen in real time. It's like a, I don't know if it's a, like central bank or something, but it, it's kind of funny just watching how, uh, you know, central banks kind of do this in the real world uh, where they have to manage different rates and different, fees and different interest rates and things like that. I mean, I'm not an expert on that sort of stuff, but it's just interesting seeing this play out and how difficult it is to balance these sorts of things. Uh, so yeah, what did you think of this, Eric? Yeah, one interesting aspect here is like, this clearly is a new and not very efficient market too, right? Like there's pretty good arbitrage opportunities out there too. I mean, this is all an experiment, right? Like, I guess it doesn't surprise me that raising it to just 3.5% didn't do much. Because if you think about it, a lot of my theory is a lot of CDPs are open to um, buy what people think are is the bottom on Ethereum. So you're opening this and you're taking your die and you're buying ETH. If that's the case, your, your funds are locked up, right? So are you really going to go sell your position because the fee went up to 3.5%. That's actually pretty cheap as far as borrowing goes still. Um, so it might take a pretty dramatic shift up, you know, to something like six, seven, eight percent, whatever that cutoff point. There's definitely a point where people are gonna say, okay, this is no longer cheap liquidity for me to borrow and and you know speculate with. I'm not sure that number is at three and a half percent. I guess the other interesting thing here at play is they're almost up on their total um, supply ceiling. So there's a cap right now on how much die can be issued, and we're very close to it. So you know, supply is going to be constrained at that point as well. Maybe that could play into this without having to uh, mess with the fee much higher or at that point but um yeah it's just like you said it's fascinating to watch this stuff play out right it's like it is a lot like what central banks have to do in managing interest rates but of course it's all done through the maker governance system where all maker holders get to vote and have a say and you know we'd be kidding ourselves if we wouldn't say this is all still very experimental right like yes it seems like just raising an interest rate would cause people to go and close and burn die, but there's so many complexities and nuances here. And given it's such a new market, it's pretty inefficient. And you know, I think a lot of people are just kind of exploring die in general right now. Um, you're probably not going to see that direct reaction right away like you would hope. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think it might take a substantial increase to get people to pay down their CDPs at this point and to burn die. Uh, because there actually wasn't much of an uptick at all in burns, uh, which was, you know, a little bit surprising. Uh, I was, I thought maybe people would be like, oh, you know, it's not very cheap anymore, pay it back. But as you said, when you think about it, 3.5% isn't that expensive. And it depends on the size of the CDP, of course, you know, how much fees they'll, they'll owe. Uh, yeah, so it'll be very interesting to see what the maker team does. And, uh, you know, if they raise it to something like 10%, you know, That'd be quite dramatic because at the moment it's as high as it's ever been and it's, it was as low as it's ever been at 0.5%. So we're definitely trying to balance it here and um, find a middle ground of, of, of what works basically. Yeah, I mean, what you just said is interesting. It, it definitely it's, um, has to do a lot with the size of the CDP. I mean, I think there's... I want to say there's like four or five CDPs that take up like the majority of the debt in the maker system. So really what you're banking on is one of those kind of caves, right? And starts burning die, but they have such large um, positions taken out. Like there's probably a lot of other stuff at play. I'm assuming very large, long ETH positions, right? So um, 
they potentially aren't going to just close it because of a, a little hike in fee. So it'll definitely be interesting. Like what's it going to take for some of these larger CDPs, which a lot have been open recently. Like I know I've, I've, you've tweeted out a few um, in the last few weeks or maybe like two months now, but these are pretty freshly minted. So they actually haven't racked up a lot of interest at this point. And, you know, it'll just be, I guess it'll just be really interesting to watch this all play out. Yeah, I was tracking a few of them. They minted millions of die, which was quite crazy. Um, and why not? It's pretty cheap. I think you mentioned last week or the week before I was discussing, uh, you know, why they were minting so much uh, now. And it was because we were approaching the ceiling, uh, I think, because the ceiling's 100 million die. They want to get in before that happens. So if they're, you know, if they're doing that, I wonder what what uh, stability fee will make them you know, just cave and pay it back Uh because at the moment the you know the die price is around ninety seven ninety eight cents, so the you know the peg isn't broken too you know it's broken from a dollar, but it hasn't broken too much to the downside. But it's still not where where we obviously want it to be. Um, you know, there's you know the disability fee is not the only way to fix this. It's also demand, so demand for for die. Uh, and but in a bear market, it's quite uh, quite hard to find demand for you know for anything really. Trading is down across the board. Of course, uh, we have very choppy markets. A lot of the exchange uh, volume is fake as well. So a lot of what you see is fake anyway. Uh, the reality is that it's just down across the board, and I think this is good because we're still early, and Maker gets to experiment with all these different things in you know a nascent market. Even though Maker holds two you know, percent of all ETH or whatever it is now, uh, but yeah, it's still great to see that we're going to get a lot of lessons learned out of this and then we'll be able to you know have an optimal solution going forward because this sort of stuff needs to uh, work you know on its own especially the maker governance system it needs to work without the maker team basically and and be self-governing now that's a long way away of course but it's very interesting to see it evolve and and you know the early signs of this governance system mature basically so speaking of interest and and fees and things like that, uh, BlockFi launched their interest account this week. Now this kind of blew up crypto Twitter, uh, especially the Bitcoiners, because uh, to earn you can earn six percent of interest on your crypto on uh, your BTC or ETH, but you have to basically store it with them. So it's not it, it, it's custodial. You, you don't actually control the your keys. Um, so a lot of Bitcoiners were like, "Is it worth risking your funds in you know in BlockFi for a six percent return?" Uh, you know, there were arguments on both sides and everything like that. And all I could think of was, "You can do this stuff on Ethereum without put it giving your funds to a central party, right? We can do this all non custodially. We've been able to do this for ages, you know." Speak, uh, speaking of Maker, you can do it with Maker, of course. You can do it with uh, you know Uniswap and fees. Uh, on Dharma, on Compound, you know, Compound and BlockFi pretty much one to one. Uh, you can do, you know, obviously the you're not going to get six percent. It varies on Compound, you know, because liquidity is quite tight there. But there, there are the options there, and you can't do that on Bitcoin at the moment. I'm not sure what what's going to uh, happen on Lightning Network and what will be enabled on there. But it was just interesting to see the Bitcoiners react to it and then completely ignore the fact that you can do what they want on Ethereum, <laughs> which I thought, you know, it was quite funny, but. You know, uh, BlockFi is good for people who just want, you know, who, who trust these centralized institutions uh, to hold their crypto. Uh, I think if, if something like Coinbase launched this, then the, the trust would go way up. Uh, the trustworthiness would go way up uh, because it's Coinbase, of course. Uh, they're completely reputable. I'm not sure how reputable BlockFi is, but I don't think they're, they're a scam or anything. But, um, you know, I do side with Bitcoiners in that I'd rather it be non-custodial. And that's why, I, you know, I, I use a lot of the Ethereum related services, basically. Yeah, I mean, clearly, if a centralized company is taking crypto in and giving you six percent, that means they're doing something with it, likely risky, higher than six percent on the other side to earn that money plus a spread, like a lot like a bank would do, right? So I haven't dug deep enough in to see like if this is just a promotional offer and that'll drop down in like a month, and then the reality is it's lower, or or what they're doing with these funds to be able to cover this six percent. I personally have really no interest in getting my crypto for interest to a centralized company like this. Uh, yeah, like you said, I guess if Coinbase did this and essentially turn themselves into a bank, um, I would probably trust them a little bit more than BlockFi, which I uh, admittedly had never heard of before this. But yeah, I mean, these options are a lot more attractive on the open finance platform that's being built on Ethereum. Now, obviously, the rates aren't quite there yet. Um, 
but that's because of a lot of inefficiencies in the the liquidity as well as you know there's just not that much demand right now for borrowing crypto assets in general like you mentioned the bear market um, so kind of as more use cases come online and more you know credit and identity which allows people to take riskier loans and then f- therefore pay, have to pay higher interest and if you're uh, lending out you would gain higher interest that'll open up a lot i'm kind of like wondering and thinking about this like the first person to offer some kind of DAP, I guess it would be where people can just put their crypto in and this figures out the best spreads on all the different DeFi apps and kind of shuffles the funds around to chase high interest. Um, and then just takes a little cut on that and passes back, you know, say 3% to the customer. And since they did all the rate finding, they they keep like 0.25% or something like that. Instead of it's kind of a hassle to have to chase around from like Dharma to Uniswap to Maker or whatever and kind of see where the best rates are. You know someone's going to come up with some kind of service to automatically track all this down, which would be pretty sweet. Yeah, I think someone will come up, come out with that. Uh, it's probably being developed right now. I I know I've tweeted about it in the past that I wanted something like that. I think it was when um, it would be dope fight if that thread, um, you know, your favorite word. <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> it was in that thread uh, where I said, I wish I could do this all from like a central app, uh, especially a mobile app. So I definitely think that's coming out. We're already seeing some things like that on like Nuo Network and Instadap uh, as well. And it's just going to evolve from there. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens in that space. So I wanted to discuss a trend as well that I've been noticing lately. So Oprah Browser... Um, you know, as a lot of people know, I have a crypto wallet now. It's a completely Ethereum native wallet. It's like a, something like a Coinbase wallet where you've got a DAP Explorer inbuilt as well. Uh, so they've got that coming to iOS. You can sign up for the beta now. The link's in the newsletter. Uh, and But the trend that I'm noticing is that we spoke about how Samsung have their own uh, crypto wallet uh, as well that's built into the phone called the, I think it was a blockchain key store or something on the Galaxy S10. Uh, and today that was actually confirmed that it only supports Ethereum and Ethereum related tokens. Uh, it does not support Bitcoin, which is insane. Uh, it's really insane. And, and I think I'll, uh, it caught a lot of people off guard because Bitcoin is normally regarded as the benchmark for crypto, right? It's involved with everything. It's always the first one to, to get the, the, the treatment of any new product. As we discussed before, it's the first asset on fidelity uh, for custody and trading. So it's really interesting to see this pattern play out where there's now two major companies that have crypto wallets that are exclusively Ethereum, uh, which, you know, and Ethereum related tokens and and dApps and things like that. So it's really, um, I don't know if it's a pattern or if it's just a coincidence, but I don't expect this to slow down, especially because uh, big companies like Samsung are signaling this to, you know, to the wider market and signaling that. Maybe Bitcoin's not as interesting to support because you can't really do much with it at the moment. Uh, you know, let's support Ethereum. Now, in saying that, of course, is you know Lightning Network coming to Bitcoin and everything, so maybe that'll be integrated into different uh, different apps. I know that Square or uh, Cash App that you know uh, Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, he's a founder of that as well. I know they integrate Bitcoin, and I'm pretty sure they're going to be integrating Lightning Network because Jack's a you know quite a big fan of the Lightning Network. So it might turn into a war between these countries of which kind of chain to support, uh, which is you know funny to see, especially from bigger companies just embracing crypto in general after, you know, crypto has been around for ages, for like 10 years now. Um, you know, Bitcoin used to be regarded as just a play thing and now it's entering mainstream. It's on Samsung's flagship phone. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it was quite uh, funny to see these two things happen at the same time, basically. Yeah, definitely. I mean, to me, that just means these are smart companies. I mean, I've tweeted about this a lot in the past, and I kind of mainly started it around um, the whole Venezuela crisis, and people were talking about get people there to use Bitcoin, um, you know, which is I agree with, like someone that has a a very um, worthless currency because of bad government policies, they should use something like a crypto, which is going to be to them a lot more stable, even though we do have some volatility. But, you know, I always say, like, why are we telling them to get Bitcoin? If you get Ether, you can go on the open finance platform, you can put your money to work for you, right? You can actually have like a savings account and you can earn interest and you can take out loans. Like there's actually stuff that you can do with your money, right? People don't want to just stare at their money. They don't just, yeah, sure, you should save some, but people like to spend their money and do things with it and put it to work for them and earn interest. So, you know, it doesn't surprise me at all to see companies that are looking to invest in the future. Um, 
of I guess crypto and blockchain on their platforms to be integrating Ethereum and DApps only because in reality, you know, people want to go out there and and lend and borrow and um, buy crypto kitties and um, God's Unchained packs and and all that stuff, right? Like you can actually go do and explore a whole different universe. Now, yeah, maybe if Bitcoin gets lightning, I, like to me. Bitcoin's never going to have any like apps to go use. Yeah, sure. There's talk of like laps, lightning apps, but I just don't see that coming to fruition. I still pretty much firmly believe that Bitcoin at this point should just settle into their digital digital gold narrative. I think it's not really that bad of a narrative for them. I, I think kind of trying to compete with Ethereum on the application side and like the open finance and usability of crypto is just kind of a lost cause at this point. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure eventually Opera and Samsung will probably add the ability to just store Bitcoin on, in the wallet. But, you know, beyond that, to be honest, there's not that much to offer there. It's funny that you mentioned that there's uh, solutions for, you know, people in Venezuela or other countries that have, you know, inflating currencies uh, on Ethereum for them to use it in different finance apps. And I think the best thing is that they don't have to, you know, use Ether, Volatile Ether. They can use DAI, of course, right? Uh, we've seen this play out already with the Burner Wallet and the XDAI network that Austin Griff has put together. We've seen it play out now with DAI Card from the Connects network. There's going to be so many more of these things popping up, and it's just like a such a smoother onboarding program, um, you know, process than something like the Lightning Network at the moment. Sure, the Lightning Network will improve over time, and you know, it might uh, come up to the usability of Ethereum. But at the moment, Ethereum is just just killing the game. I think. Yeah, I mean that's a it's an excellent point. I mean, someone that lives in a country that has hyperinflation, yeah, sure. Bitcoin and Ether would be nice, like it would help them, but they probably in all honesty want access to the USD because that's kind of where, you know, where you would flock to uh, currency wise, right? It's always kind of the stable and the strongest across the world and they can have that and die, right? So of course, kind of explaining, it's still complicated explaining die and how that all works, but you know, they probably would rather have access to that than Bitcoin or Ether. I totally agree. Yeah, for sure. And as the DAI ecosystem evolves and it gets accepted in more places, uh, it'll be a great uh, kind of currency for people to use in these countries. So I'm, I'm hoping, you know, I, I know that DAI is integrated with something like Sendwire, which is like a fiat um, crypto uh, kind of exchange merchant uh, platform, basically. Uh, not an exchange, but like a merchant platform, like a BitPay, um, I think. Uh, they're really cool. They're integrating with Burner Wallet as well soon. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely just going to keep getting better from here in terms of onboarding new users into crypto. Yeah, having those, having the on off ramp where to a user, um, you know, it's just all of a sudden their USD is on a chain. Like that's the way to go, right? Instead of like in all reality, it's going to take years until people are like, okay, you got to get ether and then you got to go open a CDP and you lock your ether there and now you have die. Like people are going to want just this kind of instant on and off to their um, fiat and Sendwire is a cool project. And it seems like that's starting that idea is starting to get integrated into certain applications, which is extremely bullish to me. Yeah. The synergy in the Ethereum ecosystem is unmatched here. Uh, Make is pretty much partnered with every single you know, single company in the crypto ecosystem to support DAI. I mean, Dharma announced this week too that they're supporting DAI now. So it's just become a snowball effect where everyone sees everyone else supporting it. So they want to get on board as well, which is beautiful. All right. The last thing I want to talk about uh, with the project updates was uh, not really a project update, more of a, a blog post that you put together, Eric, around fixing Ethereum, uh, the Ethereum fee market. Now, this is EAP1559. This is really, really cool. So I had a read of this myself, of course, uh, and I'll let you give the high-level overview, but it's basically changing the fee market mechanism for Ethereum for, for the better, uh, from what I can see. You, you summarized it well at the end of the blog post where you say that you know, users can save up to 90% uh, in transaction fees. Uh, this will enshrine the economic value of ETH, the protocol level. Uh, and there's, you know, a bunch of other usability uh, and security features that come with this. But I'll let you give the high level overview. Yeah, I mean, that was a great summary. I mean, I guess first and foremost, this is something I'm actually very passionate about. And I think that the community should really consider this EIP in the next um, network upgrade, which is Istanbul. Um, I've put a thread out on Ethereum Magicians to kind of help shepherd, shepherd that process forward. I guess a little background. Well, let's step way back. The fee market, fee mechanism that Ethereum uses today is can be known as a first price auction. So basically, people bid 
for their fee or for their transactions using gas fees to get put in a block, right? This is actually highly inefficient because there's not a lot of knowledge about what others are going to bid. And people, long story short, people end up overpaying for what they would have actually had to pay had they had kind of better um, knowledge of the market and therefore more efficiency in this. So yeah, I put it in the blog post, but most of the time people pay you know up to and even over five times the amount that they should. So basically this, I don't want to dive too far into the technicals. People can go read it. It's out on Medium. I think I have this tweet pinned on my Twitter right now in case um, people haven't read it, but essentially puts in a mechanism to the protocol to replace this auction model. And instead, there's a base fee that floats with the demand and capacity for the network. So if the demand's very high on the network, this base fee shifts up. If it's very low, this base fee shifts down. Um, this base fee for every transaction would have to be included. It's eventually burned by miners. So like you mentioned, um, that totally removes the possibility for economic like, abstraction on Ethereum, which to me is extremely bullish. That means that you would never be able to get around using Ether for transactions on the protocol layer, which right now it's very hard to do, but it's technically possible on proof of work chains like Ethereum and Bitcoin. So, you know, if the base fee is then burned, people are going to say, okay, well, what are the miners making? There'll be a very small tip above the base fee that the, that people will pay. This won't turn into an auction model like today, though, because there's actually capacity in the blocks and the base fee adjusts up and down. Um, so you don't need to get into this bidding war. So yeah, I, I'm a big fan. It would really improve UX because wallets would basically be able to predict what um, the transaction cost is going to be, and people can just you know hit send. Um, there's still the ability to kind of lower that and say, I don't mind if I'm in the next 10 blocks. You can still do that gets rid of um, economic extraction because it enshrines Ether at the base protocol and it saves people money first and foremost. So I suggest people go out and read this. Um, definitely um, would like to see more comments on the Ethereum Magicians thread as well. And if people have questions about it, just reach out to us on Twitter. But um, I would like to see this be pushed forward for sure. Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing is the enshrining of ETH at the protocol level um, as the only token to be used to pay fee for fees because there's a lot of talk about economic abstraction and just a quick high-level overview. It's basically the uh, act of paying the gas fee or the transaction fee in, in, in another uh, currency besides ETH or another token. So theoretically, you can do this today uh, you know, in out-of-band methods so you could directly pay a miner in DAI or even US dollars or whatever you want to pay uh, and they, and tell them, hey, can you include my transaction in the block? This is incredibly inefficient. And no, I don't know if anyone who does this, there are services online, I remember for Bitcoin that will let you do this to like skip the queue. Uh, but I think you'd still pay in BTC. Um, so, but regardless of that, uh, we can do economic abstraction at the uh, UI kind of level as well through what's called meta transactions. So this basically lets the users send out uh, DAI or something out of their wallet without actually having ETH because on the back end, the DAI will automatically be converted into ETH. That ETH would be used to pay the gas fee and then the user wouldn't see any of that. They would just see their DAI going from one wallet to another. Now, that is definitely the way to go. I don't think we should be having it at the base layer. Uh, because it will compromise the value and the security of the Ethereum network for a variety of reasons. I won't go into them now, but some of those reasons are listed in, in my blog post, why Ether is valuable. Uh, I go through some of this as well. Uh, so if you want to go check that out, that's on the ETH Hub Medium as well. Uh, but yeah, so I really want to see this happen as well. So as Eric said, go read his uh, uh, blog post. It's linked in the newsletter. Go to the Ethereum Magicians uh, forum. You should just be able to search uh, Eric's name and it'll come up under that. Uh, and I, I'd love to see this implemented in the next network upgrade. I think it's desperately needed. And I know uh, Vitalik has spoken about this before as well in the past uh, and thrown his support behind this as well. So it'd be great to see this uh, implemented. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to other people's comments on this one. Yeah, that actually one very important thing I forgot to mention is this actually started uh, via Vitalik. He wrote a paper about this in 2018, and he's the person that actually created the EIP. I, I've been following it for a while. I was kind of waiting for Constantinople to pass to start, you know, put out the post and and start talking about it. But it, it was initially his idea, and he's given some presentations on it as well. If you go to YouTube, I don't know the actual name of the video, but it was at a Ethereum meetup sponsored by TechCrunch where he gave a speech and he. He kind of walks through this and explains it. Um, he obviously seems pretty bullish on the idea since he wrote the paper <laughs> and the EIP. Um, and one final comment is the other benefit is you're actually burning Ether now through the base fee mechanism. So you're technically... Um, 
that's shrinking supply, right? So that's going to reduce total um, supply a little bit as well, which is bullish on the economic side. Yeah, and of course, that will just increase the security of the network as well, because theoretically, the price of um, ETH should increase as well. So we have a more secure network. Cool. So uh, one thing on on-chain activity this week, uh, DeFi activity is actually down since December. Uh, and I don't know if this peak bear market, or I think uh, you mentioned before to me about how uh, people getting frenzied when they thought the bottom was in, uh, how you know ETH bottomed at like $80 a couple of times. Uh, and maybe people were just uh, going into frenzy, especially with makeup, d- drawing die out to, to buy ETH. You know, we had, there was a lot of buzz around stuff like Compound and Uniswap and now Dharma as well. Uh, Dharma activity is actually up, which, um, you know, each week to be expected as they launched their Libra platform in the past couple of weeks. And they're um, offering a really, really competitive, uh, not even competitive, just blows everything else out of the water. You can borrow die for 0.1% on Dharma at the moment if you're uh, accepted as an early user which is quite insane. But yeah, I, I saw this this blog post by Blockboard that basically goes through and says DeFi activity is down uh, since December. To be expected, I mean, crypto is all hype driven at the end of the day, hype and and FOMO driven and, you know, narrative driven. So we, we see these extreme ups and downs all the time. So it's just interesting to see, uh, you know, Blockboard put this together in a quantitative way and display all these pretty charts. The blog post is in the newsletter, of course, for anyone who wants to see, but it's it's pretty good and pretty detailed. Yeah, I mean, I guess everything's down and at a low, kind of like you mentioned, bear market. I mean, social media engagement's definitely down across Reddit, Twitter, whatever it might be. I mean, if you look at Google Trends, like Ethereum and Bitcoin are at like five-year lows, basically, like way off the peaks of the bull market. So I think just in general, sentiment's still pretty low. And we kind of went through this hype bubble of open finance. And yeah, it's down. It's probably because price is stabilized a little bit too. It'll be really interesting, you know, once price takes off again. And I guarantee someday it's going to happen. When? Who knows? Today, tomorrow, 10 years from now, who knows? But when it does, um, it'll be really interesting to see how people react with CDPs, right? Are people going to keep opening them to leverage, you know, more and more as price goes, or are they going to start closing out maybe their positions that they bought at eighty dollars? Um, my personal opinion is we might not see another large boost in DeFi activity until kind of um, the decentralized exchanges get their act together on the liquidity front, and that might get really kickstarted actually with the Stark decks. So they're using we had Starkware obviously on the podcast. They're doing ZK Starks. Um, at first, well, there's obviously a privacy benefit to anything done with ZK Starks, but they're going to work on scalability of um, decentralized exchange. And if people haven't listened to that episode, I highly suggest listening to it. It's personally one of my favorites. Um, but I think as we start to see scalability come to decentralized exchanges like 0x, that's going to boost liquidity. And then we're going to see another pickup in activity. And, you know, I, I love Uniswap, like one of my favorite projects by far, but it's not like your typical order book exchange that kind of high volume traders are going to go use, right? It's more kind of just swapping tokens. And, you know, I know people do use it for heavy trading, but it, it, we still need something like a zero X to take off to really kind of drive that usage and liquidity on the exchange side. Yeah, I like Uniswap as well. Uh, I do have questions around how scalable it can be. So I do hope that we see more of these uh, zero X based relays or other kind of decentralized exchanges start to see more volume. Uh, as you know, as we've spoken about before, it's easy for, easier for Uniswap to get volume because they incentivize liquidity providers. So you know the liquidity providers can earn fees if they provide liquidity to Uniswap. Whereas on Zurex, it kind of relies on a traditional market maker model, and they have to you know incentivize these market makers to go in. And if there's no one actually using the the decentralized exchanges, then the market makers aren't really going to make any money off the spreads. So. Uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what happens in the bull markets. Uh, and as you said, as the uh, deck space matures more and becomes faster, especially with the you know the Starks technology, Starkware tech. Um, so yeah, uh, I think this is just you know, not not a sign of the times or anything. It's it's more just a cool down because we we're seeing a cool down across the board. So uh, it'll be interesting to see the rest of the year how. If it keeps declining or if it just picks back up again, because there always seems to be this new kind of DeFi app that comes out every couple of months. It just blows everyone out of the water, right? So we had Maker, of course, and then we had Compound, then Uniswap, and then Dharma. You know, there's, there's always something happening uh, and the tools get easier to use uh, use these things as well. 
uh, like InstaDAP and uh, Neuro Network came out recently too. Uh, I know there's a few other ones in development. So I think that's another big thing to it as well. People just need to be able to access this easily. At the moment, it's clunky. It's complicated. It's really geeky. It's only for people that are really into the ecosystem. So when the usability is there as well, I expect this stuff to tick up again. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, th- I think that next big kind of like aha app is definitely going to be Stark Dex. At least that's my hunch. I, I haven't even used it or seen it. I saw the the talk about it, but I just, to me, that's going to solve a big problem that's there. Um, and yeah, I mean, we just need to solve the rate problem too, right? Like th- th- you look at um, Compound, like there's a ton of lenders of say Ether and like a 50th of on the borrowing side. So you're having to spread this, you know, that, to lend ether, I think it's like 0.1%. Like who's going to take the time to even do that, right? So we got to find some more use cases besides just lending crypto. I mean, we just talked about BlockFi. They're offering 6%. I think you can go to Bitfinex and probably the yearly lending rate on Bitcoin is probably around that as well. I think last time I looked, it was between like 5 and 6% a year. Um, so like the centralized options still offer better rates. So we got to find... You know, eventually we'll get there as the market gets more efficient and there's more use cases. I guess to me, it's like as we start to get more tokenized assets on chain that people are going to want to lend and borrow. Um, I could see that happening, but really the big push is going to be once we start to have some kind of reputation, credit, and identity solutions that allow you to not have to take out, you know, 150% collateralized loans. Yeah, that's definitely another big factor. We've spoken about it on the podcast many times, how this over collateralization is just locks a lot of people out, uh, especially people who don't have, you know, obviously don't have much money or people who want to get a loan and don't have crypto, but they want to kind of put up something else as collateral. So I don't know if they've got a house or something or, or a car or jewelry or whatever. You know, it, it's kind of hard to imagine how you would do this in a fully decentralized way uh, because these things exist in the physical world. They don't exist on, you know, uh, on the blockchain. So you can't guarantee things like that. But as you mentioned, there are identity solutions that are coming out and things uh, of similar nature that will allow these things to, to proliferate. You'll be able to tokenize these assets and there'll be legal recourse as well. Uh, so it's kind of like, uh, I guess it's DeFi-ish in that regard because it's not totally decentralized. You're still relying on central parties to enforce different laws and uh, regulations. But at the end of the day, it's still going to be better than what we have currently. It's going And there's going to be so many other use cases that people come up with that we don't have anything dreamed of yet, basically. Yeah. I mean, what you said about the tools being built out, that's what I'm loving right now. Like maybe activities dipped a tiny bit. To me, open finance and DeFi is fine, right? It's still kind of a growing bubble and narrative to me. Well, bubbles may be the wrong word to put it. I don't really see it bubbling, but um, it's a growing narrative at least. And we need tools to help analyze it and kind of dive into it and make it easier. And that's definitely, I think, what we're seeing pop up in the last month or two, which is awesome. Yep. Uh, looking forward to seeing more pop up and definitely we'll shout them out in the newsletter once we see them so you guys can check it out as well Uh, and we'll probably talk about it on the podcast going forward as well so speaking of the bear market the one thing that isn't in a bear market in crypto is developers now electric capital uh co-founded by someone called avik chal i think that's his name uh so Electric Capital put out this report about uh, devs in crypto, basically. Uh, there's a whole tweet thread about it. I linked it in the newsletter. Uh, it basically goes through how the number of devs devs has grown exponentially, especially for something like Ethereum. So it was quite interesting to see that the uh, devs have, have more than doubled, uh, basically, since I think it was since a year ago or something. So 2018 was really the year of building. Uh, I'm just going through the tweet thread now. There's there's so much activity here. There's and, and what was really amazing was Ethereum is the uh, biggest uh, developer team in crypto on the core protocol. There is 99 unique developers on there. Now that of course is because there's multiple implementations of Ethereum, uh, Parity and Geth, whereas on Bitcoin uh, and the others is core of course. Um, but Parity and Geth are the major ones. Whereas on Bitcoin, I think 99% of nodes run Bitcoin Core. Uh, it doesn't require as much. Uh, maintenance because there's no real upgrades at the protocol level, uh, you know, like there is with Ethereum every eight or nine months. So that wasn't surprising to see. Uh, and it also wasn't surprising to see that the total uh, developers across the entire spectrum on Ethereum is just absolutely dominating every other chain. Now, this is obvious to people who are in the space, but it was great to see this quantified by Electric Capital and put out into a nice little chart. You'll be able to see all this uh, in the tweet thread yourselves. 
Uh, they also dived into other chains uh, here. So it was interesting to see something like EOS leading up to its launch. There was a lot of hype around it. There were a lot of developer, a lot of developer activity. But since then, it's kind of fallen off a cliff. So you know, all hype, no substance, as I like to put it. Um, you know, a lot of the other chains have kind of petered out. Uh, something like XRP is, is is pretty low with developer activity, but it's remained constant. Uh, same with uh, you know, IOTA's kind of dipped. Uh, Litecoin's dipped. You know, all these other less interesting chains i like to put them <laughs> have dipped but ethereum is on an absolute tear so yeah it's quite crazy to see this and obviously not unexpected for us right eric yeah exactly although coindesk tells us that uh bitcoin's number one developer power so i don't know what's going on <laughs> i remember that you, you weren't a fan of that at all <laughs> no that was like the most ridiculous analysis i think they just took like um, I think it was just like the Geth repo and basically said that was Ethereum's development power and then compared it to the core Bitcoin repo. I mean, I gave him shit for that like three or four months ago. I, I still don't think it's fixed. So it's good to see some actual reporting around developer power come out, which, you know, yeah, this is, I mean, to us at least completely obvious. Really, all you have to do is kind of follow the meetups and DevCon and stuff like that that are happening across the world. And like the turnout is incredible. I mean, these it's freaking packed with people and they're all growing in numbers and just a lot of people eager to learn. Um, and, you know, we talk a lot about a lot of metrics, um, you know, how much is locked in Maker, DeFi activity, transactions, are blocks full, but in all reality, this metric is probably the most important out of all of them, right? Um, even beyond what price is today, like having the developer power and the passion of um, a growing developer base um, is what really matters. And that's what's going to push us forward. So that, that was really cool to see this report. And, you know, even though we knew this was the case, it's it's nice to see some numbers behind it. And it's funny you mentioned EOS. I tweeted out the other day, I was looking at their uh, repo. First of all, it looks like Dan Larimer has just completely quit the project since December, which isn't that big of a surprise because he's done that twice in the past, um, one of them being Steam. But yeah, their their GitHub repo in general has just pretty much died off. So I, I joked, is this like the... Um, on the coding side is this like the exit scam of coding basically like you get it get the project to launch and you make billions of dollars then you just stop committing to the code hey yeah yeah, yeah. I, I saw that tweet. that was quite funny um you know it's interesting you mentioned this metric being one of the best to look at uh, i definitely think so as well because it's very hard to fake something like this almost impossible so you see all these real people going to these events you know we've seen it at devcon if denver if whatever like so many events that that pop up around um, ethereum like in the next month we're going to have edcon which is another big conference in sydney uh then in may we're going to have earth ethereal and eth nyc and you know there's going to be he's people going to that sort of stuff whereas something like daily active users which i absolutely hate and i just Oh, I hate that metric, right? That can be faked on the blockchain. We've already seen a lot of services pop up or you know, a few services pop up for EOS that allow you to buy users for your app, basically, because transactions are essentially free. Um, something like Tron, which is, to me, just a scam anyway, so it doesn't really matter, but they, they can easily fake transactions as well. Um, you know, a lot of these, these chains can fake a lot of these metrics that are very hard to verify as being fake, but they can't fake developer... Uh, activity, uh, real life developer activity, uh, unless they paid off a bunch of people to come and be devs. And you know what I mean? It just becomes like this whole conspiracy thing where it's just impossible. Uh, whereas at these ETH meetups, you see thousands of developers. And there was a stat put out by uh, ETH Paris, I think, the other day, where they're like, there's a ten the attendance is up a ton. So it's definitely up across the board for, for Ethereum. A few other projects are up too. I mean, like, some of the other smart contracting platforms but you know as i said you can still fake that sort of stuff uh, and i haven't seen anything you know any massive developer meetups around it either so it'd be interesting to see what happens there but ethereum is definitely the place to be there's it's not slowing down it's it's unstoppable at this point uh it's still such a nascent industry but i think i actually saw this as well i, I saw a tweet thread about how a lot of people are migrating away from big tech because they don't feel like their work's meaningful anymore so something like facebook or google where these companies are ad revenue based and they're just exploiting users in order to make more money 
Uh, whereas crypto is completely opposite of that. It's giving the power back to users through, you know, self-sovereign data, currency, uh, all these sorts of things. So, uh, yeah, I just think this the developer ecosystem is going to keep growing at a rapid pace. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is the number that if this ever started shrinking or falling off, that's the number that you want to be concerned about, right? So to see it exploding even through a bear market is great. I mean, I laugh when people like link me to some scam EOS gambling app and they're like, look, we have thousands of daily active users that, you know, it's better than Ethereum. You should come over to EOS. And then meanwhile, their GitHub repo is just completely dead and there's <laughs> there's not that many developers working on it. I mean, there's a lot more issues to eos than just that um but in reality like this is the number that matters and that's all there is to it exactly so yeah if i was seeing consistent you know developer activity die down then yeah of course as you said we'd be worried but that's not going to happen for a while uh, especially because i think the winds of society as i mentioned before are changing a lot of people are jumping ship over to something much cooler much more nascent especially a lot of the younger people uh you know like like myself i mean people you know early 30s or, or before that uh, they definitely feel may feel like they missed out on being part of you know the early internet days you know like the early to late 90s uh in early 2000s uh, some of them were still obviously in high school uh or you know younger than that so this is a way for them to be part of something that they perceive as big as the internet or so a lot of us perceive as as big as the internet uh so yeah i fully expect that metric to keep growing yeah, I mean, it's definitely clear at these conferences, like the, it's a very young crowd, right? I'm sure the, everybody there kind of wants to be a part of thing, uh, part of building something like this. And you made a good point. I mean, we're seeing a lot of people not be interested in the big techs or switch over from them now. I, I always see like ex Google and stuff like that and a lot of developers' profiles. So clearly people are making the switch or they're coming out of college and just not having much interest in going to work there just because of the path some of those companies are going. I mean, just look at Facebook, for example right I, I can't imagine there's too many yeah they pay well and there's a lot of people that are driven by that obviously that's kind of the biggest incentive but um kind of it's not the new and exciting thing to go work for something like so the big tech companies like it was say 10 years ago or so um now obviously they still have the majority of the money and and uh the job still but i do think we're going to see a shift out of there start to happen yeah, you're not going to change the world working for Facebook or Google at this point uh, in most of their departments. I know, you know, obviously they have the R&D departments, things like that. But as I said, their revenue models revolve around exploiting users, um, using user data to generate as much ad revenue as possible, whereas in crypto, it's basically the complete opposite. Uh, so and that's another reason why I think daily active user metrics is bullshit, but <laughs> we'll leave that for another day. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole episode. Yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> Cool, cool. So thank you everyone for listening. Uh, that's it for this week. If you haven't subscribed to the newsletter, go to ethub.substack.com. Make sure to subscribe. And of course, the podcast that you're listening to right now, be sure to subscribe at podcast.ethub.io. And we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Into the Ether podcast. You can subscribe to us at podcast.ethub.io, as well as follow us on Twitter at, at econoar and at Zazzle 0x.